All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode. That's right, of the London is Blue podcast. Hopefully, your favorite Chelsea podcast and a part of the Men in Blazers Media Network. Dan, one of your hosts here. And look, we're not talking talking about the Kentucky Derby. We're talking about a London Derby where Chelsea smashed, smattered, shipped to smithereens the Tottenham Hotspur <laughs> once again. And look, Nick, we had to suffer through the only home loss pretty much ever at Stamford Bridge yeah. to Tottenham. And we're going to relish every opportunity we get in a bad season, in a good season, in the best of times and the worst of times. You can always take solace in a day ending in a Y. It's typically a time that Chelsea beat Tottenham. Yeah, uh, for those who don't know what Dan's talking about, our, our second ever trip to London as a as a podcast uh, we took about 15 people over and we saw the the loss to Spurs to Mauricio Pochettino Spurs at Stanford Bridge for the first time in 28 years. And that was uh, one of the drunkest nights of our lives. It was pretty it was pretty insane. But um, speaking of, uh, you know, Antonio Conte's name has popped up recently, Dan, and one of his all time best quotes, the level of the Tottenham maybe is not so good. And uh, turns out that man is right. They do seem to be falling back to earth, gettable for many of us who are looking up from our position, the table to say, hey, we could possibly be there or we could reach to be there. I know Aston Villa supporters, uh, one Matt Law included, but a few of friends that I know, very happy for our performance today, beating Tottenham on the day to nothing. That's what we're going to get into in this match review. But of course, we always kick start it with what you, the listeners, the viewers, and the supporters of the podcast think with the three-word match review. So run it back in some three-word micro bits of content, Nick. Lots of, lots of familiar faces, and uh, you know it's good to see them show up on a day like this. SP Beal, one of the... One of the veterans of our game, for sure. Why not sixth? Question mark. Dare to dream, I suppose. Um, Def Jux Daddy, uh, friend of the pod. Uh, we showed up. We did. We showed up. It was great. Childish Gambino. I don't think the real one, uh, but maybe. Who knows what, what Donald Glover's doing these days. He has a couple albums coming out. Set Pieces, comma, Mate. A lot, lot of mates in here. It's pretty great. Uh, Tyler Martin with... Potch, Pummels, Pasta Coglu, twice this year. Yikes. Spanish Joe, <laughs> uh, all six points. And more importantly, Hair Force One <laughs> and, and a photo of Mark Kukurea, who we will definitely be talking about today. Uh, Raf joining the, the, the chat again with uh, Jehovah's Son Scores, uh, referencing Trebo Chalaba's little shirt that he had on. Matt Fitz with Alfie Pocket's Son. Uh, You'll believe that in a second. Chelsea FC in USA. London is blue. Winky smiley face, which we're not even going to count as a word. That's just an emotion, Dan. So it seems like everyone's in good spirits. You know, perhaps the stink of uh, eight days ago has worn away, perhaps. It does feel that way. Look, I'm simple at times, and I can find joy in very, very simple things. I use the same word three times. It's all about the inflection. Mate. Mate, mate. <laughs> What'd you uh, have? Some order restored. Uh, you know, the, losing to Tottenham, much like losing to Arsenal and and some of these other teams where we haven't had the best record, is just not acceptable to me. So the fact that we beat them twice this year feels like we're we're back on the good foot. So I, I feel decent about this. Well, we're going to get into all the match details in just a moment, but we're going to get our quick admin out of the way. We want to say thank you to Rice Sports, the podcast. Great way to do so for free. Five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Always appreciated. Also, you can hop over to YouTube, subscribe there. We're loving everybody leaving likes and comments on the videos and hitting the bell icon to get notified when we drop a new video there. Everybody who's joined up and signed up for our free weekly newsletter, The London is Blue Dispatch, often written by the wonderful Sam, you know him as CFC Central. Great Tiago Silva tribute in this week's edition. If mm-hmm. you missed it, 
links in the description to get subbed up so that you don't miss next week's. And you can join in the conversation for a free or paid way to support the podcast in our wonderful Discord community too. But look, this was a match against Tottenham. It was this past Thursday, May the 2nd in the Premier League at a little bit of a fortress again. Stanford Bridge, final mm. score line, Chelsea 2, nil to the Tottenham, nil to the Spuds. And look, goals came the 24th minute with Trev Chalaba Woo! off that Gallagher assist. And then Nico Jackson just, you know, finding a way, making a way, having a way to have it happen in the 72nd minute. And two goals. Cole doesn't, good. Cole doesn't get an assist for that, for that wonderful hitting of the bar. God, he, he does not. Harsh. It's, it it is harsh. harsh. We'll, we'll, we'll judge it harsh. The, the first thing that I want to tee up for you, Nick, though, before kickoff, we knew that this was coming. We knew from about a week ago that we are the Shed and the Chelsea supporters would be flying a Connor Gallagher, TIFO banner, Chelsea since birth, as it reads on the top, for those who haven't seen it, a little bit of a nice animated version of one Connor Gallagher, captain's armband in full display on that mint kit. Feels, thoughts, opinions? It's fucking great. It's fucking great. I mean, look, uh, anyone who's listened to this show or is new to the show should know that I love Connor Gallagher. A lot of people do. Uh, you know, the, we are the shed group. Uh, there's a lot of banter about whether Connor quote unquote deserved a banner or not, or if this was the right thing to do or not. We are the shed put out. Imagine being upset that a group of over 160 Chelsea supporters have organized something for the Chelsea supporting youth product. Who's captained us captained us most of the season. Guess how we got the money too? hundreds of Chelsea supporters, international ones to donating. Look, I, I genuinely uh, in a season full of stupid uh, at every turn, something stupid happens everywhere. This is a nice thing that was done for one of our players. It's a, a supporters group supporting one of our players literally in their charter to do this. Like this is what they do. And they don't operate, you know, through any funding of any super millionaire or whatever. It's a lot of anonymous and and noted donations from people who just want to see the atmosphere at Stanford Bridge be as good as it can be. And these guys do a, a job in making that happen. I don't understand how it's even possible for people to have freaked out about this four or five, six days in advance saying he's not worthy. He he's not even good. He's not even going to be here next year. Just throwing the most heinous, stupid shit out there, Dan, it really upset me. And I, I guess I don't understand mostly because he legitimately is one of us. You're, you're just slating one of your own, literally one of your own, uh, you know, since he was a tiny, tiny baby, like he was born into this family and it's, I don't know. It it really upset me to be honest with you because I I think there the, the the notes that I saw were well X player didn't get one so why does he get one? He's he doesn't have the skill or talent blah blah blah. Like just shut the fuck up. I I can't even believe that there was an issue over this. I will say a couple of points here about Connor Gallagher's season so far. He has played in 45 different matches for Chelsea this season. That is the most across the squad. He is tied for starts at 41 with Axel Disasi. He is 60 minutes, just 60 minutes shy of Axel Disasi too for total minutes. And that's at 3624, which puts him around 130 minutes ahead of Moises Caicedo, who's the next highest there. When it comes to goals and assists across all competitions, he sits at 14 right now, six goals and eight assists, uh, tied with Arheem Sterling for total assists, uh, tied second overall. And then and what else do you want? What else do you want from a guy who's been a midfielder, who's played further forward, who's we've recently seen play with left wing, who's played in a three person midfield that has not operated extremely well, has looked really sharp in a midfield two pairing, which we'll get into more detail, but hard to take anything away from this other than being overjoyed that in a season where you said they're silly, they're stupid, they're things that haven't gone right, that they're actually still pockets of Chelsea supporters that are trying to will on this side 
that are trying to support from the stands that are trying to show up for the players in the hopes that the players will show up for the badge, will show up for the club and will show up for them. And that is not something you've ever doubted with Connor. And so that is, I think a very good reason to reward him with this type of tribute before the match and uh, very exciting. And then look, Tiago Silva is going to get one too at the end of the season. Other players are going to get some between now and then, but this is a, a really good thing to celebrate and recognize. And, and just another note, as someone who's actually painted TIFOs in my time, it's a lot of fucking work. You want to know why there are TIFOs every single match where they reuse some TIFOs from previous seasons. It takes hours and hours and hours and someone who's really really good at projecting a small image and making it a big image for everyone to see in the stadium it is incredibly difficult work to do and it takes more than just your money it takes time it's something that people don't have anymore so i don't know uh i i am super happy for him i'm so glad that he came out and played a wonderful match today alongside the rest of the team and you know he's he's our captain so i'm i'm very pleased well, speaking of team, Nick, remind the people who was on the pitch. And look, some of the names on the bench might be unfamiliar to people <laughs> based upon the fact that zero senior starts amongst them to get an opportunity to kick off in this one. Mate, please. Uh, I got this. Uh, look, uh, Captain Connor Gallagher in midfield. Just want to start with him on this glorious day. Georgi Petrovic uh, between the sticks. Another uh, odd back four of Alfie Gilchrist, Trev Chalba, Benoit Badiashiel, and Marku Correa. We'll talk more about the injuries here in a second. Uh, did I mention Captain Connor Gallagher in midfield alongside yeah. Moises Caicedo in a wonderfully uh, gifted pivot? And then Noni Matawake, Cole Palmer, Mikhailo Mudrik, and Nicholas Jackson make up the rest of the starting 11. Uh, there were uh, limited substitute appearances today uh, due to the bench of Cesare Cassidy, Josh Akeem Pong, and Jimmy Tarainen, uh, Marcus Bettinelli, Zach Sturge, Leo Castledon, Keanu Dyer, Tyreek George, and David Washington made up the rest of the bench. That's right, Dan. This was uh, actually a Premier League game, not an under-23 game, not an under-18 game, not a PL2 game, nothing. This was an actual Premier League game. And every single one of our subs, minus Bettinelli and, and Cassidy, are Cobham. It's pure Cobham on the bench. So uh, it's pretty – uh, one, I think it's well, insane. And, and Washington, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah, right. But, like, six of them, <laughs> that's, that's pretty decent. Uh, one, it's insane uh, because of the injury situation. And, two, it just shows you uh, that even in a situation that isn't so great from an injury standpoint that we have young guys who are ready to step up and do a job. So follow Chelsea Youth if you want to know more about any of these players. Look, a, a Larry David Cobham, pretty good. It would have been an awesome three-word match review, too. Yeah. But we're going to talk about the stats in this match. 1.98 expected goals for Chelsea, 1.54 on the day for Tottenham. We had 38% of the ball possession. They had 62%. 16 shots for us, 19 shots for them. Five of ours were on target, though, to their three. Nine off target for us to their seven. And then two blocked to their nine blocked. The defense, absolutely fantastic on the day. Uh, look, one yellow card across the entire match. Very, very questionable. The fact that you had 16 fouls from Tottenham, 12 from us. Maybe more than one card. Maybe more than one on the card. Even you could have thrown on one for us that, for good measure. That would have been fine. We had four big chances to Tottenham's one. We missed two of ours converting the other two, and they missed their one. We had one hit of the woodwork and uh, goalkeeper saves. We have four to their two as well. Random stats, because we know you love them. Off to Joe with one. Mauricio Pochettino is the first manager to complete a Premier League double over Tottenham, having previously managed them in the competition. Delight. And a second one from Chelsea FC. Chelsea have won more Premier League matches against Tottenham, 35 than we have against any other team. Salute emoji. Indeed. Uh, look, it should have some moment of the match time, and there were uh, quite a few to take out of this, but, uh, you know, the sellies on point, people pointing out the, the individual celebrations, wonderful. Uh, Kukurea uh, providing a basketball screen to Trev Chalaba for the first goal, wonderful. Nice job from him. But the one for me, and... Look, uh, young Alfie Gilchrist had a had a tough time against Arsenal the other day. Did not have a tough time against Hyungman Son today, and he didn't have enough a tough time, Dan, because he kicked the shit out of him all game, 
and didn't pick up a card. And you know what, young man, you deserve it. You're my shithouse moment of the match. Look, some say it's more prestigious than the Premier League player of the match. Yeah, Many I people mean, are saying it. Trev gets the hold of a trophy, but Alfie gets to go in tomorrow with the knowledge that, you know, he's made this old guy proud. So that's pretty cool. That's all he could hope for. Well, look, we're going to talk about how Chelsea overcame 14. That's right. 14 injuries to sweet Tottenham in this match across the two fixtures this season. But we're going to do that right after an ad break. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Nick, we, we knew what was coming in this match. We knew that everyone from Levi Colwell all the way down to Romeo Lavio would not be available. It was 14 people in either team training, partial team training, undergoing medical assessment, undergoing rehabilitation program, undergoing or continuing to undergo the rehabilitation program. There's a distinction there. The ah. different classifications for 14 different players who were unavailable on the day, which led us to the lineup that we saw and the bench that we saw. But Chelsea still managed to get it done against this Tottenham side. I just like your initial thoughts, hits, reaction on knowing how the team overcame the adversity to get it done on the day. Uh, yeah, I don't, I really don't know. I mean, I, I think, you know, one, this is one of our better team performances of the season. Um, and I think that they actually, I don't know if it was because of the injuries or if it was because all of the noise was, you know, was happening around this team or if it was, uh, you know, an inspired second half against Villa at the weekend or what the hell it was, but they came out and played like a team today. Um, they pressed when they could, Obviously, legs are are getting pretty tired this time of year, especially with a very thin squad. Uh, Poch has not shown that he's re really willing to trust most of that bench to to get any real minutes. So, you know, you kind of were running out with that eleven, and you're going to have to run with that eleven for most of the game. Um, again, that's it. that's Poch's choice. So, fair enough. Uh, and I, I just I. I think from minute one, Dan, what I was really impressed by, and I wasn't sure how, you know, we're just, you're never sure how this team is going to come out and perform. We've seen them come flying out of the gates and have shit second half. We've seen them limp out of the first half and have an inspired second half. We've seen them look terrible in both halves. We've seen them look good in both halves. They came out and looked like they were up for a fight today. And I like a Chelsea team that is up for a fight. Yeah, it was... I think very evident from the first few minutes. I mean, again, we've seen slow starts. We've seen some faster starts, not necessarily slow, but faster for us. And then we've seen just absolutely flat performances. I think this fell into the, we got into gear quicker in this match. We found a way to start to move, move the ball around. I mean, you know, whether or not you enjoyed Mudrick's entire performance, at least in the first half, there was a lot uh, to like with the way that he and Kukurea were moving the ball forward, making it really difficult to play on the left-hand side, which I think I, you know, I enjoyed a lot, but I'm sure that Brendan Johnson and Basuma and Poro <laughs> did not enjoy on the, uh, the left-hand side of their defense. So uh, or the right-hand side of their defense, left-hand side of our attack. So I think there was a lot to like, a lot to enjoy about how this team set up on the day. I mean, I think in general, we talked a little bit about Connor, but I think the the Caicedo Gallagher midfield pairing, getting a chance to stretch their legs, getting a chance to play against multiple better sides in the Premier League. We're seeing, I think, enough data now that there's something, there's something there. Somebody's starting to cook in that in that kitchen there and it's going to be really interesting to see how we continue to to take this forward into the summer how does that change potentially the club's decision to to let connor gallagher go even if it's a plus in the ffp and the psa or P psr situations it feels like you're finding goodness here whether it's for pochettino or another manager in the future and the last thing we want to do is taking away goodness on the pitch yeah i mean look i i mean the results are just they're there for you to look at i uh, you know i mean the the midfield with those two in it has been so much more dynamic so much more defensively solid uh so much better i mean it's been so much better and you know i think you're you're 
you know, kind of hearkening your memory back to preseason, you know, we were there watching all the preseason matches in person. And I remember Potch rolling Connor out in that, in that double pivot. And he looked really uncomfortable in the preseason. It didn't look like it, it was going to work. And then of course he starts the season. He's a little bit further advanced doing a lot of the pressing, all that sort of stuff. So what I can deduce from this, Dan, is that midway through the season, after, you know, a variable, you know, run of results, Connor Gallagher just up and learned the double midfield pivot and made the left side of that his own. He's not a left-footed player, just gets it, just understands spacing, understands how to cover for, let's be honest, not the world's best left-hand side, and has really allowed Moises Caicedo to dominate, (laughs) which is, you know, again, if you're thinking about all of the different ways that we can maximize this squad if everyone's healthy moving forward, getting the most out of your 100 million pound midfielder seems to be a priority to me. Um, Let's hope we can get the most out of the other one too once he's healthy. But like, it's just been a revelation. and, And it's, I, I think if you look at the results where those two have played together, you, when you say there's something there, of course there's something there. And he's yours. <laughs> he doesn't cost you much. You know, he's, he's, you got to give him a new deal and you got to make that deal commensurate with, you know, captain's performances and stuff like that. But, you know, in a, in a year where almost everyone else, ha- everyone else has not been healthy. DSAC, you know, of course, gets a late injury in the season. That's kind of a bummer for him because he was on a, a decent health streak as well. He's just been there doing the job. And and now he's allowing Caicedo to do his job, which has been amazing to watch. So win-win. Yeah, it was interesting to look at a chart. And this was from CFC Daily on Twitter or Uh, formerly Twitter, now X, but it was games missed via injury, and it was sorted as a table here. The only two players, knock on whatever, it doesn't have to be wood, whatever is going to bring us good luck to not jinx this, the only two players to not miss a match this season for Chelsea through injury, Nico Jackson and Connor Gallagher. Now, Nico missed games because of AFCON, so he does not have the same number of plays. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> hey, look, look. I, it, it was through injury. It was through injury. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, Connor Gallagher is the only other one who's missed zero games. And Con- Connor argue. got rested a couple games and then was brought on in those games, I think. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you're right. So it's just it's it's interesting to see. I think the the other thing, just to kind of talk about the Caicedo piece there, really benefiting from some of the way that the Kukurea was in, inverting in, I mean, a little less space to have to manage in this game, which I think when he gets a little bit more of a space to control a zone to own, very beneficial for him. I mean, he was fouled uh, four times. He's, he's getting the ball in good positions. He's drawing in people, which is creating space for others. He won eight out of his 11 ground duels. I mean, it was a really, again, just another solid performance, you know, that, mid seven trending upwards to an eight type of performance that you want to get out of a player that you paid over a hundred million pounds for. Like you're starting to see, Hey, quietly, like he's been having a string of good performances where maybe earlier in the season, particularly with the combo that we were using, wasn't getting maybe the most out of him. So I think there's still a lot that's going to have to be figured out uh, at the tail end of the season and in the next season, but good signs there. Other good signs was just how good, Trev Chalaba was on the night. Our guy, Trevo, phenomenal night. The Premier League player of the match with, as they said, goal, clean sheet, and the player of the match performance. I mean, do you want to start with the goal? Do you want to talk about the defense? Where do you want to go with him first? Um, I'm look, the, the goal, I feel so happy for him. I mean, like he's obviously gone through the ringer of the series, he's been mentioned to leave for the last two seasons had injuries. Uh, You know, I think we all remember that he had a decent little goal scoring streak when he first started for Chelsea and, you know, scores in his first game against palace scores against Juve, like has had his moments, right. Where where he's put the ball in the back of the net. And one, it's like one of our better goals of the season. I think just technically it's beautiful to watch. And two, you know, I, I think, 
in in a in a lineup that it look is 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 just stretched about as thin as it is uh as it possibly could be with all the injuries like we mentioned goals have to come from everywhere right you know you, you can't over rely on attacking subs to come in and make the difference for you and i I guess maybe I was a little curious if, if that impacted everyone's performance today, knowing that there wasn't a safety net, knowing that there wasn't, you know, the ability for someone to come on and save them. You know, I, I think Trev has been a really, really, really solid to really, really good this season when he's played. And if not for him, I mean, he's our best center back right now. I think by a mile, it's not really that close. It's, Patently obvious to me. I think it's patently obvious to folks who are, you know, deeper in the tactics than, than I am or have their coaching badges. He's a big, tall, powerful, skilled guy. He can pass out of the press. You know, I think you saw, especially early, um, that, you know, Tottenham was pressing high like they do. They play this idiot high line, and I don't understand it because it's so easy to break. Mate, and, you don't understand the high mate, line? Mate, you know what, mate? That's my fault, mate. Um, I, you know, I just watch, watch him pass out of the back, watch him understand the space, watch him on uh, defensive set pieces, which we've been shit at, get his head to a bunch of balls. Him and Ben Wad both did both, uh, both did great at that today, I should say. I, I am so pleased for Trev Chalba, another one that the sporting director structure should be looking at to stay because I, I, He's the best one we got. Yeah, he was really sharp on the night, continuing to show just how good he is, just how valuable he is. And, you know, for all the rumored center backs that Chelsea are out there looking at in this market, boy, oh boy, a, a Premier League proven center back that came from your academy that can score and pop in with the occasional goal that has such a dynamic passing range feels like the type of player that we would like to keep. Another player. We might like to keep as well, uh, though he is more rumored to go on loan next season. But we've been enjoying the antics that he's been getting up to the celebrations. <laughs> it feels like a fan is celebrating when you watch Alfie Gilchrist celebrate. It's like the ultimate fan experience. <laughs> uh, he is the winner of the prize. He got the golden ticket and he just had another really, really good night. If you think about it this way, Min Song averages per 90, 3.76 shot creating actions. Um, and they're like, there are different things. There's like passes that lead into it. It's total shots. Um, like, so just kind of use that as like a, I guess a baseline for like, what would, um, a good contribution or a good night out for, for Sun B for the team. And he had zero shots on the night. I don't know if that's good, Nick. That feels like it's a good thing. Dan, are you sure? I, I, I'm not a big stats guy, but could you could you help explain that to me like I'm a five-year-old? Uh, zero shots on target, zero shots off target, zero shots blocked, uh, one of two dribbles successful. Now, I think if you just looked at it and you didn't watch Alfie play, you didn't pay special attention to him, you weren't kind of dialed in on that matchup, you know, you might look at, well, you know, he son won all these ground duels. And you know, Alfie had good recovery, though. Alfie recovered well. He played Sun into bad positions where he didn't get an he didn't get the opportunity to shoot on target. Right? It's not a bad thing to get passed on a duel if the duel is into an area that is not setting you up or setting up another player to then be in an action that is threatening your defense. Like so, he played a very very comfortable defensive performance against Hyungmin Song, one of the better attackers in the Premier League, the best attacker in this Tottenham side and acquitted himself very, very well. Super enjoyable performance. I think the the stat scores or the SOFA scores on this one get it completely wrong. I think he had a really, really great night, and it's just the way that they do their math is super fuzzy sometimes. Yeah, I I, I, was, I was thinking about this. Um, I think when he checks his pockets when he gets home, he'll be like, oh, God. Hyungmin's son is here. This is crazy. Puts him in his little key tray. Um, also, uh, if you're, I don't know if you're an Akon fan, Dan, but uh, there's a song called Locked Up um, that uh, could be applicable here as well. Uh, look, I mean, I bet when Tottenham saw our lineup, they were salivating at the prospect of their best attacker running at uh, a 
a 20 year old academy graduate. Uh, you know, Arsenal had a better time against him, to be frank, um, than than Tottenham did. And I think what I saw today was a guy who still has that youthful exuberance, of course, and maybe uh, is a little too aggressive in moments where he doesn't need to be. You know, there's that moment where he uh, son was running kind of towards the corner flag and he kind of tripped him and, and gave a free kick that way. And that's all stuff that he will learn and get better at that's very easily coached out but what i saw from him mostly tonight and and i think that this is just a credit to the academy system uh that phil you know espouses on the you know during the season uh, on our podcast otherwise known as chelsea youth uh is that his communication skills are elite uh is he perfect right now no did he get crossed up a couple of times sure did no no issue saying that but on counterattacks, when Trev was yelling at him or he was yelling at Trev and they were pointing in the area to cover or on set pieces when they were moving each other around and kind of matching up in the right way, this is stuff that I think is, is the hardest stuff for a young player to do in this league because it is so fast. It, everything happens at light speed and you have to be able to make decisions and communicate while you're running 100 miles an hour to get back on a counterattack. It's incredibly difficult to do. I, 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 again, if you were if you were to give me at the beginning of the game that Sun wouldn't score, I would have been like, "Wow, really? That's unbelievable! Like, what a great performance!" And I saw people online were like a, a little upset with this performance. I, I think context is everything here, right? Like, th- the context is in the period of eight days or nine days, he improved his level of performance significantly from where it was. And that's not an accident. I mean, first of all, there was no one else to play that, to play that position tonight. So he was going to play. And second of all, I was just, again, you're, you're looking at a guy who is a, a number of appearances this year, who wasn't originally I think supposed to be a part of the team, but was, you know, I think drafted in due to injuries and stuff like that. He's been fucking great. And he's a joy to have out on the field. Yes. I mean, he's a joy, Dan. I I, I love it. I, I love seeing guys like this get their shot and take it, you know? Yeah, I think people will be like, wait a minute, you've gone, you know, almost half an hour and you've not spent a ton of time talking about our attackers because, you know, we'll get to that in a moment here. We want to cap off on the defense because, look, it was a clean sheet. And those are fucking rare this season. Those are <laughs> those are diamonds, my friends. And we need to celebrate and recognize our defense when they do a great job. Ben Marbati Shield had a bit of a bounce back game. Good night for him. Mm-hmm. But boy, oh boy, Hair Force One, as we mentioned earlier, Mark Kukurea. <laughs> this is a really good night for him. He had a really, really good overall performance. There have been, you know, you get one of two marks. <laughs> you, you get a mark that just is. 100% pedal to the metal and is mistiming everything and balls are bouncing off him and deflecting in for goals. And then there are nights like this where he's a little bit more of the inverted fullback. He's doing good interchange with the attackers. He's pushing the ball further forward. He's not finding himself out of position too regularly. This was a very good night for Mark Kukurea as well. Definitely. Um, you know, I think the crowd sung his name multiple times today that had to feel pretty good for a guy who hasn't been, let's be honest, the Stanford bridge, uh, favorite, uh, by any means uh, over the last few years, uh, your, your point about his positioning is right. I mean, you know, I noted this at at halftime, but you saw in the first half in attack, you know, and and we largely played on the counter because it's so fucking easy to play against the sideline that why would you try and possess the ball? (laughs) Just let, again, let them make a mistake and just run at, you know, their, their back line, he, he got, he was basically like an auxiliary midfielder in attack. And then, you know, in transition, Batty Ashiel would, would shift over and basically like give Brennan Johnson something to think about. And then Kukurea would eventually retreat back into that space or then cover center back for, uh, for Batty Ashiel, which I thought was really good. You had that combination in midfield with him and Connor too interchanging. And there were times where Kukure actually pushed further into the midfield than Connor, which I was like, I always am like, get back, go, <laughs> go back to your position. But um, I actually think they used his passing really well tonight. Um, you know, I think Mudrick and uh, Jackson 
uh, actually made the right runs with enough space around them to pass the ball to feet, which was nice. And, you know, again, I, I thought that if you were, if you were a Tottenham fan looking at this game, Brendan Johnson, incredibly quick dynamic player going up against Mark Kukurea, you were probably like, well, oh, man, we got the, the rub of the green today. Like, absolutely not. Kukurea shut his ass down. Um, he didn't contribute at all. He looked like he got visibly frustrated right before half and never bounced back from that. And then I think, you know, Kukurea just did his thing. Uh, it, it was uh, oddly impressive. I, I think there were a lot of people who had him as man of the match today. I would be hard pressed to argue with that. Uh, he, you know, Trev was mine, but only Same. by this much. I mean, only by a little bit. And I think it's just the little bit being the goal. So, you know, all, all that being said, I, I think if you were, if you're a frequent Cucurella, uh hater or whatever, uh, or, or dissenter, I should say, you have to acknowledge when he plays really well too. It's only fair. So uh, he played incredibly well tonight. And again, that that back line is incredibly makeshift. You know, I don't think, you know, maybe but one of those players were, were getting anywhere close to a first choice back line. So I mean, it's a big deal. Well, tons of praise, tons of recognition to the defense that patchworked together, got it done against Paslakagu and the Spurs team there. But look, we're going to talk about Nico Jackson. We're going to talk about some praise from Matt Awake, particularly after, you know, he, we did not feel like he had the best match previously. And so we always like to make sure that when things turn, that they come due and the praise comes with it. And also some weird responses to questions that Pochettino got after the game. So we're going to talk about all of that after our last ad break. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hi, right, Nick. Just off the top of the top of that dome that Nico Jackson has with that wonderful haircut, just keeping it nice and tight, has now... Being below Conte, if you will. The, you know, Drogba has sported that previously too. And it's, it's actually timely that we might speak about Nico Jackson and Didier Drogba in the same sentence, because with that goal, 11 now in the Premier League on the season, Nico Jackson has, is one up on Didier Drogba's first season in the Premier League, first season at Chelsea. He had 10 goals in that season. Nico Jackson now with 11, four matches left to play. A top tier goal celebration. Absolutely fantastic. How do you you not love that? I mean, come Uh, on. Yeah. I just, you know, for, for someone who has really not had a good patch recently in terms of the, the misses, the, the should have goals, the goals that have gotten chalked off from VAR, the, the goals that VAR has not wanted to give. He got it done at a wonderful header, wonderful header. Yeah, really difficult header. I mean, you know, he's he scores the hard ones and sometimes doesn't score the easy ones. But you know, I we've talked to Matt, we've talked to Naz. He's he's had this number in his head all year, right? When they've interviewed him, he knew exactly what the number was. He knew exactly that he wanted to beat that number. Uh, I think he has nineteen total goal contributions or something like that. Or no, fifteen now uh, for the season. Um, all comps, so that is not nothing. Um, and or is it 19? It might be 19. He I'm has, sure. uh, it's 19 now 19. with the goal okay. today. So he had 18 right. going yeah. into this match. So 19 goal contributions, all comps, not too shabby. I think we had the high water mark at 15. So, okay. I think he's, he's achieved that. Um, it, this, you could tell this one meant a lot to him. Uh, w- one, it's an incredibly difficult bit of skill to, loop the ball over, right? The ball doesn't have any speed to it when it bounces off the bar, hits the ground. And so he's just like waiting for it and has to, with all of the muscles in his neck, get the ball to loop over. Seeing the Tottenham players collide with each other on the way into the net was just like, uh, Benny Hill music should have played. It was, it was lovely. And look, I, a striker who scores against our rivals is good with me. I I genuinely, I, I want to see him score more. I want to see him be more clinical. I think everybody does. There's no doubt in my mind that he has room to improve. But what he does bring is an incredible amount of skill on the ball. 
he does he has improved this season dan his yeah. hold up play even though he's not maybe the biggest body in the world uh you know he went regularly up against two center backs for tottenham today and came out with his fair share of wins from that incredible in transition has enough speed to get behind bandevin a couple of times who is incredibly quick the raw materials are here and the results have largely happened you think 19 goal contributions all comps the four to play if he gets past 20 there no one could look at me and say man this guy can't, he can't play for chelsea like yeah. it's it's by far a success in terms of recruiting especially for what we paid for him so i i think Again, I, I have been a fan of his all season. I think he has had an incredibly hard job to do and has made some of that harder on himself for sure. Uh, but there's there's some there's a player here. Well, at 19 goal contributions at uh, 14 goals now, which is one more than he scored across all competitions for Villarreal last season, five assists this season across all competitions, which was the same he had at Villarreal last season. He is now plus one at 19 in comparison to last season at Villarreal. Now that was on less minutes. So the conversion rate per 90 has gone down. So like we just have to kind of contextualize that appropriately, but it's also at the same time with an increase in difficulty from playing in La Liga, playing in Villarreal to oh, playing yeah. in the Premier League and to being the only striker and being the striker on a very dysfunctional team and not knowing where you necessarily wanted to play him at times. And, you know, it's also with, you know, Cole Palmer, you know, needing to get into a place where it wasn't just then the sole responsibility of Nico Jackson to be the guy when you have it shared across a couple of guys, it tends to be a little bit better. And this was a night where Cole Palmer, I think he's showing a little bit of fatigue. I think he's showing a little bit mm -hmm. of the season catching up with him. This first season in, in, in senior football is he's been phenomenal. He is still going to be at the end of the season, the player of Chelsea's season, but what a great way to help your guy out and say, Hey, look, we can share this load. We can share this responsibility and I'm, I'm happy to step up. I'm happy to score. You know, if you could say, Hey, across Nico, across Palmer, across Matawake or, or Mudrick as, as like the third option, one of us is going to score in every game. That's all you need. That is absolutely all you need is you need three players who can do it with regularity and, and, and get you kind of in those positions. And so really, really good night for him. I, I like this stat that Sam CFC central, a uh, good friend and contributor pulled together that 36.3% of Nico Jackson's Premier League goals have come against Tottenham. <laughs> Delightful. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Again, it was striker who scores against our, our rivals. I th we've had a couple of those in our day, Dan, and they're an absolute treat. So, yes. Yeah. So, Matawake is the other one we wanted to spend a couple minutes on, just saying, you know, again, much proved, improved performance on the night. Mm -hmm. uh, Pochettino's quotes, just in particular, are, you know, he kind of said, Nani Matawake, for me, if you analyze him from the start of the season, all the conversations and meetings, clips and videos, things like this. He was capable today of doing a fantastic job with the ball. Of course, he's an offensive player, but without the ball, he's doing a fantastic job helping Alfie Gilchrist defend. That is what we need for the future to build this competitive spirit. Anything in particular stand out in the way that Medawake played on the night that you really enjoyed? Yeah, I, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't a, the biggest fan of his Villa performance. I think people disagreed with me on that, and that's totally fine. I was a big fan of this performance. I and I was a big fan of the defensive side of his performance today. Again, you're starting uh, a a young player in Gilchrist at right back against Human Son, and you know that that could be a recipe for disaster if the team doesn't defend like a unit, right? So not only were the center backs passing players off to each other and 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 to the midfield who were there to kind of trap them and and things like that, but you know, notably, Noni Matueke gets back a handful of times, uh, almost gives away a penalty, but doesn't, uh, luckily, uh, and takes the ball and runs and gets fouled and, you know, clears the ball up to G uh, to Jackson to break the press. And, you know, the, the moment that I remember this game was, you know, him tracking back, taking the ball from Son and advancing it up the field uh, and getting whacked, I think, uh, by one of their fucking idiot players, I think Emerson Royale or something. And he got up and was like, 
up getting the crowd into it. And they, they responded like crazy because that is the sort of effort that we are used to seeing at Chelsea football club. You know, that only your Eden Hazard level players get to not do the defensive side of the job. Like that is the, that is the tier that is like the God tier of offensive player that doesn't have to track back. We've all heard those stories. Matt is not at that level. Mudrick clearly not at that level. Even Palmer not at that level. So you have to track back. You have to help out and press. You have to be able to win the ball back so that you can go do the job that you actually want to do, which is play really neat passes, score goals and, and all that sort of stuff, do tricks with the ball. And, you know, offensively, he was really, really good today. I thought that he was, for me, dispossessed a hell of a lot less, was got, you know, by Emerson Royale on multiple occasions very easily, really showed some skill in the box, being unselfish, cutting the ball back for Palmer a couple of times didn't quite work out, but it's a sort of like unselfish play I like seeing. But this was a much, much better performance. And, you know, it's a much better performance, and he didn't get a goal or an assist. And that is just, if you watch football, that's how you know. So five of seven on his dribbles, uh, successful versus total attempted. Very good. Nine out of 15 on ground duels one, which means, uh, look, you know, you'd love to see that trending in that mm-hmm. direction compared to maybe where it's been previously. Two out of two on aerial duels one on the night. He did lose possession 10 times. Uh, had two clearances, though, was fouled twice. So, again, if you're getting in positions where you're getting fouled, you're winning your duels, you're being successful with your dribbles, like you're making it difficult for defenders. And uh, that's what we like to see. What we don't like to see are weird quotes, though, from the manager coming out of the match. And again, I I do think it is a challenging moment, right? Chelsea about to end the season. There's rumors of uh, that, that get brought up and then dispelled just as quickly as they make it on the internet, like Chelsea paying for flights for other managers to come into town and potentially be considered for next season. Poch had several questions related to what's going on with his future. And, you know, some of these were, you know, these were the sky, like, we need to have time. It's not my decision. And fear of the sack. I don't know. It's difficult to see. You know, every single week I'm under the scrutiny and the judgment. It's not my decision. Ask about the aim for next season if he's here. I can't tell you. I cannot say nothing. What can I say? What can I say? Chelsea, if we want to win the match, uh, if we want to match the history of Chelsea, I think it's a lot of work to do. And we'll have to see if we have time to build it this way. Just very... Again, he's getting asked the question, right? And so, like, at a certain point, you just have to, you're going to have to answer in some way, shape, or form to satiate the individuals who are asking the question. But it, it felt like, you know, as good as the quote was about Matawake and Gilchrist, right? Like, great praise about Matawake, great taking the player under his arm, great building him up, like, player management stuff, like, plus, plus, really enjoy that. This is just like, hey, dodge the question. Like, moving in a direction that says, hey, you know what? Like, I just want to talk about how good, our, like, how fantastic our players were on the night. Like, what a great night for our supporters. It's been a tough season. You know, I don't want to talk about it right now. We're, like, we've got four games left for the season. We're focused on our next match. Like, little Belichickian type of thing. Like, let's just, who's yeah. who's our next opponent? Who are we up against next? We're pushing for Europe. We're trying to make it happen. Next season is what I'll think about come May 19th. Yeah, I mean, he's his media training is non-existent. I, it was he was in such a weird mood after the game. They showed his like Sky Sports interview, and he looked like he was going to come out just like guns blazing, really excited. And then it just turned into this weird like the interviewers couldn't even ask him a question because he just went on these like long winding quotes that no one could understand and. Uh, it and not because of of the English translation. It, it was because it was just they they were odd. <laughs> they were really odd quotes, and I, it's this is another just like get out of there. Like if you don't want to talk about it, you can just leave. Like you or or say next question or do the redirect like you just mentioned. Like there's so many ways to address this sort of thing, and yeah. you know I, I'm I'm surprised that he's not better at that. Uh, you know, it's not the first time he's ever heard these questions in his career, right? He heard him at Tottenham. He heard him at PSG. He heard him in Southampton. I'm sure like it's, it's just, it's, it's odd. And like, look, 
if I were him after a performance like this, I would say some of what he did say, which is, you know, we're growing. This is the sort of thing. I think he mentioned on Sky Sports, like, this is the first time in 10 months he's really happy with a performance or something like that. And like, you know, some of that I'm like, yeah, sure. But, but then follow it up with like the, the proof point, what you're going to do next, like, you know, build belief back in the fanboy, back in the fan base. And one, one of the interviews on sky was like, well, how does this change your relationship with the fans? He's like, well, that's an entirely different question. Just left it at that. And I was like, you know, you know, one way to do that would be to not go to the middle and like, high five with some players, high five with some of the managers and then bounce. Uh, you know, we kind of were talking to a few people who attend matches like this would have been the perfect game to go gin up the home support, to go tap on the the chest where the badge is, you know, I, I, again, some of it's theatrical, right? Like, yeah. you know, some of it might not, might not be the most genuine thing or the most natural thing to you. But just a little bit of that energy, a little bit of that, you yeah. know, go, I got him type of thing, that intensity, man, that goes a long way with Chelsea supporters. And whether you're watching from thousands of miles away on a television set or you're in in the bridge, you know, from the highest seat to the lowest seat, from the closest to the pitch, from the most far away, that type of thing gets 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 us excited. And that would have been something on a day like this. You did the double over them this season. Really good result. Helps us push to be competitive still with, you know, European spots on the line. Like, could have helped galvanize the home support for the next run of matches. Yeah, man. I, 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 take the W. <laughs> you, you did here, the hard part. Here, here, sir, I'm handing you the W. Would you like to <laughs> no, take it? No, no. Do it. No. My hands don't work. I can't. I can't grab it. It, it. It's very odd. I don't want to belabor this too much because I, yeah. I think on the night, on the whole, it was like a, a really positive evening, and the team played really well. But like, all you have to do is go out and go, "Wow, what a great performance!" I can't believe, you know, with with this thin of a squad that they came out with that much energy. I'm really proud of the work that was put in. I think we can replicate this performance and move on. Like that's all you have to do. And then go out and beat West Ham and see if you can say that again. Like, just keep saying it until someone believes it, you know? Yeah. Well, no other matches were played in the Premier League on the day. So just a little bit of a table update here. Chelsea end the day in eighth position. That's right. We've jumped up out of ninth. We are we are climbing up to be at the top end of mid-table. Not, not in the <laughs> mid, mid part of mid-table. We're at the top part of mid-table. Almost. <sighs> We are 51 points on 34 matches played. We have uh, 14, 9, 11 with a plus 6 goal difference at the moment. We are two points behind Newcastle, who's currently sit in 7th. Now they are on plus 19 for goal difference right now. And we are three points behind Man United, who have a 1 goal difference. Very unlikely that West Ham, who are currently on 35 matches played in ninth position with 49 points and a negative nine goal difference. Like we are, we are starting to move in the right direction. Finally, after the last couple of weeks here, we can see potentially with sixth place being Europa League and seventh place being Conference League that like there is a reality where Chelsea could have the option to to jump back into European competition next season. Now, our remaining fixtures, West Ham at home this weekend, Nottingham Forest, Brighton, and Bournemouth. Newcastle have to face Burnley away, Brighton at home, Man United at home. So that's a little bit of a double boost for us there. And then play Brentford the last match of the season. Man United go to Crystal Palace away. Crystal Palace have been getting some really funky, fun results. Wouldn't that be it, fun? Wouldn't that be, be real neat? fun? Arsenal, Newcastle, and Brighton. There is there is a world, Nick. You can picture the world. You could paint it to throw it back to our good friend SP Beal. Why not six is still on the cards this late into the Premier League season with four matches to play. This team with 14 injuries, with players we signed for hundreds of millions of pounds unavailable for the entirety of the season might somehow stumble and bumble our way into the Europa League after all of this consternation. Uh, I mean, we, we got to hope for, 
I mean, look, obviously we got to hope for, for losses from Newcastle and United. We got, we got, we have to win all four, right. To have any chance at this, just because our goal difference is six. Newcastle is 19 and United has one. <laughs> so I, I think from a math perspective, Dan, what we would really like to happen here. And I'm just, I'm going off of what realistic results could be before I say anything about other teams. I have no idea week to week, how we're going to show up. I have zero expectations for these games. I have zero expectations for how we're going to play Sunday, zero expectations for forest, for Brighton, for Bournemouth, no fucking clue. We could either come out like we did today, or we could come out like we did it against Arsenal. No clue. But for United, I think Palace has draw written all over it. I think Arsenal is a clear loss. I think Arsenal are going to cook them. I think then if that, if those two results happen, we want them to beat Newcastle. Yeah, in that scenario, you would, because then that would take three off of Newcastle. It would make it so at that point, if it's draw, it's four points that they've received. They're 58 points. Uh, again, the onus is still on us yeah. to win out. Like, if you want to get in the sixth place, you need to win out on your last four games. West yeah, we Ham is doable. Forest is doable. got to be on 63 at the end. Like, that's, yeah. the, that's the minimum. But, like, I think Newcastle – I don't see Newcastle losing to Burnley. I don't see him losing to Brighton. I don't – really see him losing to United if I'm honest. Brentford could be a weird one for them because you know I know Brentford are safe, but they've been kind of weird this season. But they I think they have by far the easiest remaining fixtures um of you know between them and United. So we really want United to go out and beat them, I think. Yeah. Yeah, because then they're on nine points and put them up to 62 at a, a maximum for what they would get. And look, I mean, Brighton have manufactured some interesting results this season. So Brentford and look, we have played <laughs> we played some of these sides and had really weird results ourselves. So like, I don't think unfortunately, I don't think any of these teams are going to have maximum return. Um, and so it's just can we can our our low be a draw? And can we not lose any of these matches? Like you're hoping for United to pick up one to two, you know, one loss at minimum, which gives them nine extra points, uh, maybe one to two draws. Uh, and so that takes another four points off the board. Again, the math starts to become wonky. You're hoping for a lot of things to happen. You wish you had taken care of your own business sooner. Uh, a couple of results, uh, not a goal chalked off in the Villa game now, super massive. Those oh, two yeah. points, you'd be on 53. You'd be on the level. <clears throat> you'd be level on points with Newcastle, only separated by goal difference, one point off of Man United. And look, in a land of like should have, could have, would have, like there's a lot of things that have could have gone better for Chelsea this season. But to still have the fun opportunity of of having this conversation with four matches left to play, Nick, that, that's what I enjoy most, that we get to talk about this together. Look, West Ham give us hell every time. We got to hope that we can beat them. Not in force away. They're in the relegation scrap. Like it's them and and Luton that are now, you know, down in that last relegation spot. That's going to be tough. Brighton is on the beach for me, um, and Bournemouth are are safe and are just kind of a weird team. But it's doable. I mean, it should be doable. But you don't. You got to show up and and play them. I mean, I I do think if we win all four. You know, not to be a guy who makes predictions, but I think if we win all four, we will be in six at the end. Well, that is the that's the most optimistic thing you might have said in the last week. So we're just gonna have to end on that one. That is a positive little bit. Dan, it's not my job to inspire optimism. It's the team's job, and then for me to go celebrate on Look, top for, of that good for the listeners of this show, it is your job to find some optimism here. So we appreciate ah. that you were able to get and manufacture one nugget of joy for them at the end of this episode. <laughs> but look, we hope you enjoyed this recap of Chelsea absolutely battering Tottenham wherever they go, but particularly Stanford Bridge. That's gonna do it for this episode. But until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high.